Good to bring the, the cheering section with me. Um, <laughs> thank you all for this award. But I, and, and thank you really for supporting PACT. Um, it is about the development of community leadership. And for me, it is the most powerful force we have for good right now and ever have. And I am humbled because I watch the video and you look at people who have come from all parts, address all sorts of needs, and they are coming together and they're taking a chance, they're exercising courageous leadership, and they're really making a difference. So I am in awe of the PAC leaders and the organization that supports them. So I think we should give PAC a round of applause, not me anybody. When you think of leadership, you look back in your life and you say, well, it wasn't obvious to me that I would be a leader. I was the youngest of a big family of kids, hyper-competitive siblings, um, some of whom are here today. <laughs> uh, it wasn't obvious to me where things would go. You only start to connect those dots later. I did grow up in the Bay Area. I went to UC Berkeley. Um, law was not my first choice but it was a better choice because I graduated with an English literature degree focused on medieval English drama. <laughs> Not the most marketable skill, but really was drawn to law for many reasons, and part was the opportunity to enact change. I'm a product of the Vietnam era, of really looking at the Watergate era. In high school, I was transfixed by those hearings and looking how the lawyers were the ones who were getting the truth out and the journalists who could speak truth to power were getting the change that we needed. And that was a very deep inspiration for me to go to law. I'm also pretty analytical and, a, and I, I love complex problem solving, pretty good writer, and I love to win arguments. You can ask my siblings who are laughing in the front. Um, but I also thought that if you had a professional degree, you'd be equal to everyone in that field. I kind of thought you got a law degree and access equaled, you know, the, the whole degree equaled the accountability you wanted. And I entered the law practice and really encountered a lot of resistance to women in the field. Uh, there were a lot of subtle and not so subtle instances in which I couldn't get where I wanted to go. And like Aaron Burr in the musical Hamilton, I wanted to be in the room where it happened. And I was determined to do that. And I worked really hard, and like Elizabeth Warren, I persisted. And I have a big shout out to some of the guys, and they were all guys, who have come here today who were my bosses, my mentors, my colleagues, and they held the door open for me to help me get in the room. And I would not be where I was without the support of these guys. Thank you. But in 1997, I did get recruited to an executive team at Apple. Um, that was not quite what I expected either. On my first day, the CFO walked in and said, welcome to Apple, you know we're in a death spiral. <laughs> I said, well, that's not quite how Steve Jobs presented the opportunity. <laughs> but it was dire. The situation was dire. The products were undifferentiated. There was, the developers were disappointed, the customers were disappointed, the investors were writing us off, as were the analysts. Uh, the employees were really, really disappointed. <laughs> but that's not what we imagined. We thought of a world in which we could have groundbreaking products that would inspire and unleash the creativity of our users. We wanted to enhance their expectation of what these incredible tools would do for their lives and their businesses, and not give them something that didn't help them in what they were trying to accomplish. We thought, imagined a, a store in which people could encounter community and joy and find these great ways to develop it. And so I got to build the fastest growing retail chain in history, which was nowhere on my trajectory. And we also created a digital marketplace in which people honestly would pay for the downloads of great content that our developers were so excited to produce in applications and content. So what was the result? <laughs> Apple is, as we know, the most valuable company in the world. Um, that was unexpected. 
But it was a lot of work, and I was tired. And I think there was another fatigue factor. For 10 years there, I was the only woman on the executive team. There were no women on the board. You battle a lot, and you just kind of think maybe there's a chance to try, a, try something else. Um, but in that quest for gender parity, I did know when I joined in 97, there were, I was the 10th or 11th woman general counsel of a Fortune 500, so we were at 2%. I've worked to encourage the next bench of leaders to come up as women leaders, and in 2018, we're at 28% of the general counsels in Fortune 500 are women. That's 140 of them, so I'm proud of that work. <laughs> Only 5% of the CEOs are women and 13% of the CFOs, but so there's obviously still work to do. Uh, but in leaving Apple, I got time to, time to explore. I got time with my wonderful family and my husband, time to breathe, time to hike in the Bay Area, which is one of my favorite things I do for inspiration and for exercise, and really the chance to listen. And that's where I did travel to many remote places and many local places and listen to what the communities need. What are their aspirations? I may be a problem solver, but I can't understand what's required in a community where there's no safe drinking water, where there's sexual violence, where there's no educational opportunities. But I can try to lift up the resources and identify places where they can get the help, find the supports, and when you do truly listen and travel the world, there's so much sadness, there's so much poverty, there's so much injustice, there's so much human rights abuses, there are environmental degradation, educational deficiencies. We know what that list is. But when you travel and when you're in the Bay Area, you find these points of light. You find these organizations that are developing the capacity of people to aspire to a different future. And that is what's driving me ever since. How do you develop that capacity to aspire? How can you hope differently? And what does it take to allow you to develop your own capabilities? We can't do it with Band-Aids. We can't do it with, with supports. We need people who can own their own destiny. And that's what I work on. But I also was confused about how to do it. There were so many organizations. They seemed fragmented. There was a lot of under-resourced ones competing for resources. They didn't always know how to measure impact or how to communicate what their value was. So I wanted an organizing principle because that helps me a lot. And I, I, I found a place where community members came together to share their contributions, to share their talents, to share their time in service of organizations that are solving community problems. And that's how I found SV2, which was an organization that really develop my capacity as a philanthropist, but my capacity to understand what's happening in our community and in our environment, and try and find and build up organizations that enhance that capacity. It's been a wonderful journey. We've doubled in size, but we're still only 200 families, and there's more to do. But I did meet PACT. SB2 has a model of grant making as well as beyond the dollar engagement with grantees. And when I was new to the game, just trying to figure out how to do no harm first as a philanthropist and how to be more effective, I met PACT on my very first Beyond the Dollars engagement uh, in an advising session. And I've been in, in love with the organization and the work they're doing and see its power now more than ever as we deal with the inequities that are abundant. abundant. But, SV2 can also be kind of a match.com for philanthropy. So you see they have grant rounds that are kind of competitive and you meet organizations. And over time, I had started with a broad lens, but I increasingly narrowed it to what were the points of influence that could most change the trajectory of our communities. And to be honest, it's women and girls. Like, sorry guys, and the guys who support them. <laughs> but they need to be educated and they need to be empowered and that has been the focus. And through SB2, I found Teen Success Inc., which works with teen mothers in the Bay Area, in the Central Valley and the Central Coast and now in Sacramento and Reno area to help 
them get through high school, onto college, develop the parenting skills and their own social emotional assets so that they can be effective in driving themselves and their children out of poverty. It's a two generation solution and it is so meaningful. As board chair, we're looking to grow our impact and trying to triple the number of families we can reach in the next few years and everybody's welcome to help on that one too. Uh, but sometimes when you do the lens, you find other organizations. Tony mentioned First Place for Youth. When I learned about the teen moms, 70% of whom are the children of teen moms, a lot of them came out of the foster youth system. And when you start looking at that, you see that children transitioning out of that system are dropped on the doorstep or off the doorstep. So really became a cause to look at how we can help them transition to adulthood successfully with the same supports that my children were blessed to have and anyone that some of the intact families are. So first place works on housing, education, and employment navigation as these kids transition out. And it's been a, a wonderful opportunity. And I'm trying to help them as they expand this model nationally to really take it to scale. Those organizations are doing incredible work, but you often see the systems around them that need to change. And I've thought a lot about the systems work and have been really informed by some incredible work that Alexa Caldwell and Heather McLeod Grant have done called The Giving Code. And they researched the philanthropy situation and the community-based organization in Silicon Valley. And what they discovered, I think, most in this room intuitively know the valley is booming, and yet there is dire poverty and inequities. They looked at the, um, this is a kind of scary statistic, there are 76,000 millionaires and billionaires in Silicon Valley. There are over 12,500 households with more than $5 million in investable assets, and yet, almost 30% of the population has to access public or private assistance to get by. That's 800,000 people. Philanthropy's been on the uprise. It's gone from 1.9 billion in 2008 to 4.8 billion in 2013 individual giving, which is great. And yet we know that the local organizations, the community-based organizations are struggling to meet the need in our community. They are struggling to meet their own needs to stay in the community because of all the escalation of price. So there is a call to action of building more collaboration across the sectors. We need to get the community-based organizations in better communication with the philanthropists who are giving, but they're not giving locally to the degree we need them to do. And there are organizations like SV2, there's organizations like ALF, which develop the cross-sector muscle that we want to try and reach all these organizations. And that is I think, one of the inspirations for me is how can we cross that chasm? How can we all build the sustainable communities that we deserve? So I'm really gonna ask all the organizations here and all the people, I see Suzanne St. John, <laughs> who's the head of ALF over there nodding. Um, we want to find that cross-sector muscle. We want to develop it. We want all the sectors to contribute to that. But how do we do that work? There is so much fear. There's so much anger. There is so many destructive emotions right now. And here's how I approach that work. And I'm informed by... Uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy was the 19th U.S. Surgeon General of the United States, and he was the grandson of a poor Indian farmer. Forty years ago, his family immigrated to the U.S., where he was able to attain the highest position of a, of a doctor when President Obama appointed him the U.S. Surgeon General. And one of his farewell comments is how I want to live. Dr. Murthy says, the world is locked in a struggle between love and fear. Choose love, always. It's the world's oldest medicine. It's what we need to build a nation that is safe and strong for us and our children. So with love, I thank you for this award. <laughs>